Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I am your host, Jason Verlindi, the publisher and founder of the Fretboard Journal magazine. Fretboard Journal magazine, as you hopefully know, is a reader-supported endeavor dedicated to telling great musician and instrument stories you're not going to find in any other outlet. We cover a bit of everything, including, of course, jazz, bluegrass, rock, folk, you name it. I just love music, and I know you all out there do as well. And today I'm talking to Frank Sullivan of bluegrass band Frank Sullivan and Dirty Kitchen. Frank Sullivan and Dirty Kitchen have a new album out called Hold On. It's got really varied material. It's getting raved reviews, some hard-driving bluegrass, some singer-songwriter songs. I think you're going to love it, and I know you're going to love Frank's story because it cannot be beat. This interview, frankly, blew my mind. He is so much more than a band leader and mandolin virtual. So he's a chef. He's an entrepreneur. He does a little bit of luthery. He's a nice guy. We talk about all these projects and a lot more. We also talk about his past, growing up in California. The fact that the U.S. military has a bluegrass band. Did you all know that? I, I did not know this. Uh, we learn about that collectively during this conversation. I'm going to get to that interview with Frank very soon. First, I just want to say Fretboard Journal 51 coming out soon before the holidays. We just sold out of our 50th issue. Thanks to everybody who ordered it or subscribed and received it. On the podcast front, a quick reminder, we have a bunch of podcasts besides this one. Luthier on Luthier, for those of you who love handmade instruments. We also have the Truth About Vintage Amps podcast, sort of the car talk of amplifier repair, if you can believe it. A lot of fun, a lot of laughs, and also some very very, very technical knowledge about amplifiers. It's a fun show. I co-host that. Mason Stoops was the guest on our most recent episode. And if you've made it this far and you're here to hear Frank Sullivan, you probably are into mandolin. So I should probably tell you that in two weeks, the one and only Sam Bush is going to be on this podcast. So if you want to hear that, subscribe to our podcast or follow us over on Spotify. Our podcast is brought to you by our friends at Retrofret Vintage Guitars. Might as well go mandolin this week. They have a 1963 Fender electric mandolin, the four-string electric mandolin. They've got a 1957 Gibson Florentine electric mandolin in stock right now. And if you, for you acoustic purists out there, they got a beautiful 1916 Gibson K1 mando cello available right now. Retrofret is one of the most eclectic and interesting vintage instrument stores in the country. I love this store. So go on over to Retrofret, click on that new arrivals tab and tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. We're also brought to you by Calton Cases, the best flight cases in the business. Whether you have a mandolin, a mandocello, an octave mandolin, a guitar, a pedal board, or anything in between, they have you covered. They have flight case templates for pretty much every instrument that has ever been built. Reach out to them, tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. Also, our friends at Peghead Nation are sponsoring the show once again. In terms of mandolin instructors, Peghead Nation is pretty much unbeatable online. Mike Compton, Joe K. Walsh, John Reichman are all instructors on Peghead Nation. And if you want to go over there and see what all the fuss is about, you can get your first month free or $20 off any annual subscription just by using the promo code fretboard when you check out on their website. That is all for now. As always, share the podcast with your friends on social media. If you love it, leave us a review over on Apple Podcast. It does help our show grow. And now, without further ado, here is one of my favorite people I've spoken to in the uh, music biz, Frank Sullivan. I hope you enjoy it. So, Frank, I've known you for a while. You came through the Fretboard Journal with Dirty Kitchen, I don't know, what, a decade ago? That was a long time ago. Yeah, maybe even a little bit longer, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've been following you, but I have to admit, until this new record and the track Modesto, I had no idea that you came from Modesto, California. Yeah, man. So, uh, yeah, I was born in Modesto, uh, grew up all around there. I I'd never, well, I guess I did live in Modesto for a short period with my mom after my parents got divorced and uh, went to uh, a high school there for like part of a year. But um, mostly Turlock. I went to high school yeah. in Turlock, California. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in Sacramento and there's no need for anyone listening to this to care about any of these towns we're talking about, except that when I think of Modesto or Turlock, I do not think bluegrass hotbed. <laughs> right on. Well, you know, it's funny. My dad's uh, whole family, uh, his mother um, came from Western Arkansas and um, like Eastern Oklahoma and then landed in Fresno. My dad was born in Fresno and she had 10 kids. But she and her older sisters, when she was um, young, 
toured around. She played mandolin and fiddle and whatever else, guitar too. But she she toured around in like vaudeville acts with her older siblings and parents and such. And then uh, passed that love of music along to all of her 10 kids. My dad is the uh, ninth of all those 10 kids in order. Oh. Like boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. <laughs> had kids all the way down the line. Anyway, one of my... Uh, uh, aunts, his, uh, my dad's older sister, my aunt Norma and her husband were registered in the Western swing hall of fame, but just like surrounded by music, my whole life in California, like Rose Maddox. I don't know if you know who she yeah, is. Yeah, of course. Rose Maddox and, um, people like Vern Williams and stuff. They would like jam with my, my grandmother and uh, other pe- parts of the family, you know, the older generation or whatever. So that kind of all just flowed on down to, uh, you know, through my, my dad's gener- generation. And then into my generation and then even a little bit further, you know, with um, my cousin, Megan McCormick. So the woman I mentioned, my older, my dad's older sister, Aunt Norma, her granddaughter is Megan McCormick who wrote that song Modesto. Okay. So Megan and her uh, writing partner, uh, Amanda Fields wrote that for me for this record, knowing that I come from there and uh, it was beautiful. (laughs) So circling back to the original So anyway, that's where that came from. Yeah. Yeah. And and if anybody has picked up the fretboard journals 50th issue, like we did a story on Luthier, Michael Lewis in there. And and yeah. obviously, you know, one of the many bluegrass spots, hotbeds in, in California is that Grass Valley Father's Day. I don't even know the official title of the Bluegrass Festival. Yeah, Father's Day Bluegrass Festival. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and you've been there for a long, long time. So I guess that all makes sense to me now. Yeah, it just kind of, yeah, I grew up kind of going to that festival and the Strawberry Music Festival as well. And Michael Lewis, uh, you know, I've known since I was a kid going to those festivals. He was like the on site luthier and had his mandolins and guitars and banjos and whatnot all displayed, ready to sell. And uh, gosh, the, what, the one mandolin, uh, I think it's the back of the mandolin, it's Rosewood that's in the 50th there. Um, I had like over a decade ago in your uh, office there. That's the mandolin I had with me. And uh, man, it's just been my companion for so long, you know, so kind of full circle again. (laughs) Yeah. And so growing up in this, you know, family where music's super important, was mandolin your first instrument? No, Uh, fiddle. And I kind of like started playing on guitar. My dad and my cousins would show me some chords on the guitar. There was always a mandolin kind of hanging on a wall. So I knew some of the chords, but I gravitated to the fiddle more than anything. And then studied violin performance in school, but played in country bands and bluegrass bands, mostly on the fiddle. And kind of as a teenager thought I might be a banjo player. So I started picking up some banjo. My dad was a banjo player as well. Okay. And then what happened after high school? Where'd you go? I moved to Alaska when I was 18. I drove my 63 GMC pickup all the way to Alaska. <laughs> okay. For music? For for money? For what? Well, kind of like one. I I mean, as you know, what uh, the Valley of California might be like if you, uh, you know, are from there. Um, yeah. It's like the first place you want to get away from as a kid. For me, at least it was. Sure. But It was for me as well. <laughs> yeah. There you are in Seattle. Right. Beautiful place. Um, anyway, no, I, I, I got this call. Well, first off, I was going to move to Montana with my mom uh, and she had a family member there. She wanted to be close to. And I was like, well, I got we got family in Alaska, too. And I get this call from Ginger Boatwright. I don't know if you know who she is or not, but she, quote unquote, the first lady of bluegrass. She had a band uh, in the 60s called Red, White and Bluegrass. And then um, she played with uh, the Doug Dillard band for many years. And that's where I met them at the strawberry music festival back to that. Yeah. And I was just a kid and I was like, Hey lady, can you want to come to my camp and jam kind of thing, you know? And anyway, she and I became pen pals through, through the years and talked on the phone and she was always a great inspiration, almost like a second mom kind of thing, you know, and told her I was moving or going to go to Montana. And she was like, well, I live in Alaska now. I'm married to Bush pilot. And I got all these gigs lining up this, this summer with a Doug Dillard band. You should come up here. And I said, all right, sounds good. Hey mom, I think I'm going to go to Alaska. Let's go. So it was like graduate high school, go to Alaska. And I, my plan was to like, just maybe spend a summer there, but I spent the better part of a decade there instead and kind of went out, you know, out, they call it outside from Alaska. I went outside and stayed in, you know, Nashville for a while and toured around with some other little groups or whatever, and uh, spent some time in Hawaii. And anyway, it was a, it was a good learning experience playing with, uh, Ginger and Doug Dillard and uh, a few others. And 
she was like connected to all these I mean, like famous bluegrass people that I looked up to and was able to meet and play with them. Like whenever I'd go with her to her through like Nashville or, or North Carolina or whatever, it was, it was a good, good thing for me for sure to start off like that. And were you, I mean, you're fresh out of high school. You're, you're playing with this legend. Are you primarily playing fiddle or are you going fiddle mandolin or everything? Well, funny you ask, because I was playing mostly fiddle in the beginning and she goes, uh, and this may be foreshadowing for sure. I, I've kind of thought this, but uh, she says, well, you play the mandolin too, right? And I was like, yeah, it's like my main instrument. Sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of jokingly, you know, and she goes, okay, well here, check out this John Paganoni mandolin that I have, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. And it was from whatever batch it was, it was, I, I think it was number 17 of 34 or something. And I was like, wow, this is great. This is a beautiful sounding instrument. And I kind of started on that and, which this is also leading to the Michael Lewis mandolin, just so yeah, you know. Yeah, okay, cool. But uh, so I started playing that with her back and forth on the fiddle and the mandolin. And then she wanted that back. And I said, oh, okay. And then I needed the mandolin. Uh, one of the times I needed a mandolin, <laughs> I, uh, of course, called my friend Michael Lewis. And he says, oh, I'm trying to find a buyer for this mandolin. Oh, okay. So he sends me a mandolin. And uh, a young guy named Scott Gates has that mandolin now. So I had it for a little while. I brought it down to Seattle to go to Wintergrass and hand it off to Michael Lewis so he can give it to Scott Gates. And he hands me that Rosewood mandolin that's in the 50th. Mm -hmm. right? And I was like, oh man, this is a, gosh, this is beautiful. This is, sounds great. Oh. Um, he said, well, just, you know, take it with you. And uh, this is after a big mandolin tasting that John Reichman did there. And uh, I just fell in love with it. And I was like, man, I, I I can make some payments. Yeah. Don't worry about it right now. You know, don't worry about it. And so, uh, I finally get the Navy band job like a couple of years later. And yeah, what was that? You gotta, you gotta walk us through all this. Cause you've had quite a life. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Arguably I'm sure, but, uh, yeah. So I auditioned for the Navy band and then, uh, in Washington DC for their country and bluegrass group country current on electric guitar. And, uh, they offered me the job. Next thing you know, I'm doing pushups and boot camp. going, I need to pay Michael Lewis for this mandolin. Now that I got a good job. Uh, so I call him up again. I'm like, Hey, can, I want to make some big payments to you on this mandolin because I love it so much, you know? And he was like, man, just play it. It's yours. Tell people about it. You know? And I was like, man, that's, I've already been doing that, you know, and I'm going to continue to do that. But man, what a incredible, generous gift, you know, from a friend. And I was like, wow. Okay. Well, this is my companion. I've recorded with it. I've done all kinds of, you know, shows with it. And, uh, the international stuff, I'm kind of scared these days to to travel with it because I don't want them to be like, oh, well, you know, mm -hmm. this has that and the other thing on it. But uh, but it's just a beautiful instrument and I'm all, always proud to have it. So anyway, that's the mandolin I ended up with there. And I uh, can't remember exactly how I got there, I guess from Alaska, right? I was talking about Alaska. We we're talking about Alaska. We started Modesto, then we went up to Alaska. <laughs> I think many people right now are going, the military has a bluegrass band. So right. what, what does that entail? Why did you seek out? I mean, you probably wanted to serve, but like, why tell us about that gig? Funny you ask because at Wintergrass in Seattle, that band was playing there. And I knew a couple of the guys in the band already from festivals and uh, even a couple of members, even before they joined uh, when I was a teenager, I'd met them playing in another band. Anyway, they, one of their members wasn't able to make it. The mandolin player, fiddle player, his daughter was in the hospital or something. And uh, they asked me, I'm, hey, guys, in the lobby of this hotel, right? Hey, how's it going? No, no, no. Hey, you want to play four sets with us this weekend? I was like, uh, sure. I don't know any of the material. Uh, well, we're going to have a rehearsal. Let's go have a rehearsal. And so rehearsed uh, intensely for a number of hours and kind of got the gist of all the music. And they were like, wow, OK, this guy can play. And, you know, he's a quick study and all this stuff. And I was like wow, that's fun, you know? And they asked me, so do you play electric guitar? <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, you know, not really, you know, kind of, I mean, I play the guitar and everything. Yeah. I can play some leads and this and that. And they were like, uh, do you play electric guitar? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they told me that oh, their guitar player was, was going to be leaving the, the elect in their country band. Uh, so it's a country band first and foremost, that has a bluegrass offshoot and uh, they go do festivals and things like that. Anyway, it's a completely different lineup now, but um, at the time I was like, okay, so I went and bought an electric guitar. 
uh, signed up for the audition. I'm like, okay. Um, spent like five or six months just getting chicken picking and telecaster, uh, you know, language under my fingers, if you will. And it was like a second job, just trying to, you know, learn how to play the electric guitar and, uh, when auditioned and they, they actually had another two auditions. They had another audition with another batch of guitar players that couldn't make the first one. And they said, well, we know you're, uh, you know, you kind of got this audition, but we, we want to hear some other players too, that have already signed up for this and want to give you an opportunity to really hone your skills a little bit more. So I went back for the second audition and it was like, okay, you got the job. And they gave me the job, and, um, or offered me the job. And I took it, went to the recruiter and he was like, what? You're going to go to go to the Navy band. Yeah. Well, you have to do this, this, that, and the other thing first. And I said, no, I, I'm the Navy band in DC. No, no. And he was trying to argue with me. I was like, well, okay. So I called the Navy band p- personnel in DC. It was like, this recruiter doesn't know what he's doing. So can you give him a call and tell him what's going on? Cause he wants to send me just some like, you know, tin can in the uh, North Atlantic or something. And, uh, <laughs> So they did. And he was like, I came back and he was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. We got you covered. Yeah. This is what we need to do. Got them all lined up. Did, would do most of the people who have been in this band, did they start out just serving as like troops and then become part of the band or are they recruited from the outside and then well, have to become members of the military? As far as like the military music program goes, you have to audition. It doesn't matter what, um, what band you're going to play in, whether it be a field band for the army or a fleet band somewhere in the, you know, in Europe for the Navy or whatever. Yeah. And then every branch has the premier bands in Washington, DC. And that's the, that's the audition I, I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I graduate boot camp as a petty officer, first class E6. Uh, The rate is MU1, if that makes any sense to anybody out there listening. But uh, so you go from like a recruit, you know, right to like, (laughs) Uh, a rank that typically takes you could take somebody like 10 years to get or more. Even. Okay. So it's because of your ability and your um, education and your applied knowledge and so on and so forth. Uh, most people that go into just the regular music program, they have to go to military music school. Okay. And uh, so they have to go through that and then graduate that. And then they get placed into a band. So, okay. I, I, I went Beyond that, I, I, I skipped that and went right to the band. Yeah, I, I think most people just probably, or at least a lot of us, probably don't even know that this these programs exist. I mean, it's basically the the Blue Angels of music, kind of um, for lack uh, of a better word. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really intense rehearsals, and you know, you your shoes are shinier than anybody else's, and you know, you're attached to the White House basically. So you have to look the part, play the part, and uh, you know. And then do you make money from both the government as well as when you play a festival? Do they pay you like an artist? Like, do you get kind of two paychecks? No, no, you, you're you on military, you know, you get military pay. Okay. Uh, and then festivals basically, or or shows that you go and do, they, they basically pay for your, I think they pay the band, they send money to them to pay for their travel or, or per diem. I can't remember. It's been so long now. I got out in 2009, but, uh, basically they pay for your, your, your expenses, I think, or some of them, but it's the military putting the band out there for, re, you know, retention and recruiting and basically putting on a good face for the military. Yeah. That's what the bands do. Ceremonial stuff too, you know? Um, yeah. Did you have to go anywhere far flung or dangerous or did you just stay put? Uh, I, luckily, no. Um, it was all within the United States yeah. when, when I served, but the band prior to me getting there had been, you know, other countries and, and I'm not sure what they've done after, but I think, uh, you know, it's attached to the white house. So if the president says jump, you jump, you know, kind of thing. So. Wow. Yeah. And then what was the decision like to leave that? Oh, for me, it was a, it took a little while. I did six years, one month and 24 hours, but, uh, I was re- counting, right. <laughs> I re- at four year mark. I re up for two. And by the end of the first year of the, the two, like at the five year mark, I was like, okay. Uh, musically speaking, I, I just needed a different kind of situation. Um, you know, playing God bless the USA and the national anthem every night was, was fine and proud to do all of that. But I I needed to be musically fulfilled elsewhere. So I gave my notice and uh, said, you're going to have to find somebody else. And uh, I wanted to just 
you know, instead of just playing music, I wanted to go make music, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. you know, and do my own thing and be my own boss and not have to, you know, ask if I can go take this time off or that time off to go visit family or go to a wedding or whatever, you know, sure. I wanted my own, my own schedule and my own thing. So. And then what was, where did you, you know, you've already bounced around the West coast a lot and, and then the country and the military, where, where did you decide home was after that? Well, coming to coming east to the DC area, I lived in Alexandria for a long time, bought a house there and okay. kind of just, got, you know, friends and, and community and all that. And then, um, uh, gosh, I just kind of felt like, uh, not stuck, but I, I always had this draw to go back to Nashville. Cause I lived there for about a year in like 2000 mm -hmm. and, uh, have been in and out of that town for so, so many years since I was 18 actually. And, um, got a lot of friends and community there too, and feel like that's home for, uh, for lack of a better, you know, way to explain it, I guess, but, um, still have a draw to go there. So I went in 2019, um, uh, ended up going there, got separated. It was a really rough year, uh, you know, just in my inter interpersonal life, mm -hmm. and, uh, moved there and, uh, was trying to start over, start again. And, um, you know, uh, eventually, uh, you know, get to like 2020 and touring around and at the very beginning and then the world stopped kind of thing. So it was like this bad year leading into another bad year, but, mm -hmm. you know, falling in love with, uh, somebody new and whatnot was always great too, you know? So, uh, that definitely was a, a beautiful thing, but it left me the opportunity to be able to write a bunch of songs, uh, with friends and, and songs of like hope and, and optimism. And, uh, of course, recognizing where you are and all of those things, uh, love, love lost, all of those things. So I like taking inspiration from life events and, and whatnot, uh, leading me to all the songs on the record that you hear on hold on really. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Hold on is one of those. I mean, it's, it's already, in the top 10, I think in the bluegrass charts, if correct me if I'm wrong, I don't often look at the bluegrass charts. It's, it's a great record. Thanks, man. Yeah, it is. Uh, I think last time I looked on the roots music charts, it was at number two Yeah. on for contemporary bluegrass and bluegrass. And a number of the songs on the record are on the singles charts on that, um, on those charts. And then the grass Econa charts that the bluegrass today, uh, yeah. website puts out, uh, one of the songs is at number one, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken right now. Yeah. Man, and it's been up there a couple of times already. I'm like, wow, it's only been out like, you know, a month really. So, so I mean, how did you decide on the, this, like the song selection, because your band really jumps from hard driving, what most people think of as bluegrass. And then you've got some singer songwriter stuff. Like we just talked about when we were talking about Modesta, like yeah. there's a full gamut of your range there. And I'm just kind of wondering how you select, you know, the material and, and what the thought process was like. Oh, wow. Um, you know, songs kind of speak, speak to me, I guess. I, I wrote a lot of those songs thinking that they were going to be on a record. Um, I didn't know exactly when that was going to come about, honestly, because, you know, the whole uh, world stopping and all. Yeah. And like, I, I'm, I'm, excuse me. I just have to say, man, that word has just been, you know, bothering my ears. So I just try not to say it as much, I guess. So anyway, um, the thought process is okay. Writing a good song with somebody and it, and it speaks to me and I feel like, Oh gosh, this, this is great. It's sticking in my head and sing it to somebody. And then it sticks in their head. It's like an earworm. I feel like every song on the record does that to some degree. And that in itself is probably a good metric, but uh, like I say, each song was inspired somehow by life events, even the covers like the song sale. I was, um, a uh, cousin of mine used to sing that who's since passed and uh, somebody that was very dear to me. And uh, I was learning it for uh, Jillian, who I was speaking of earlier uh, when we were kind of linking up and I was like, Oh, check out this song. And it's just kind of special because of this new relationship too. And she actually sings with me on that song. It's the the closing track. Yeah. Uh, and I'm playing guitar on it, just some finger style kind of guitar, just kind of like set everything down after some rompous bluegrass and whatnot, you know, uh, Virginia's for lovers. I live in Virginia, you yeah. know, uh, hold on. That was the last song I wrote. 
uh, the week before we started rehearsals for the record and um, brought it to the guys. And I said, I think this is the title track. And they're like playing, you know, we played it through a few times and kind of thought about some arrangement ideas and just jammed it. It's like, you know, three chords basically. Uh huh. And it just felt good. And everybody was like feeling good. It was like, yeah, all right. Good idea. Yeah. So that's kind of how they just live. You know, they kind of tell you really. Yeah. Same with, uh, I'm already gone. It's the first track on there. I wrote that with John Weisberger and uh, I was just getting off playing the the chords and the kind of coming up with the melody and just a couple of little lines here and there. And I said, I need to call John and see about writing the song. And in about 45 minutes, we had the bones of that song, which is the, the first one on the record, which is at number one right now on those charts we were just talking about. Incredible. And uh, yeah, they just kind of like, they come, they, you, it's not really a huge thought process. I think more along the lines of like the sequence of songs on a record, maybe yeah. the, the songs themselves. I had too many songs to record. Honestly, I have a bunch more that, you know, didn't make, make it to the record. So maybe they'll be on the next one. I don't know. Yeah. And then your bands, I mean, obviously fretboard journal, we, we know Chris look at really one of the great guitar <laughs> bluegrass guitarists touring today. Um, they're all, are they all, are they all scattered around the country or is everyone in Nashville, but you No, our bass player, Jeremy, he lives in Nashville. He's the only one at the moment. Um, okay. Chris lives in Brooklyn. Okay. New York and our banjo player, Mike, he lives in South central Pennsylvania, about two hours North of where I am. Okay. Yeah, so so you really only different. get together when you're on the road or when you're about to record a record? Pretty much. If we have some gigs, one-offs, I try to abstain from doing one-offs because they, you know, it's a lot of logistics to get everybody together for one show. But if it's worth doing, obviously we're going to do it. But, um, you know, that's the, the, one of the problems of, uh, you know, living apart, you don't have enough time to rehearse together. So sometimes in a hotel or at a sound check, we rehearsed a number of songs at our last show. We did a, a theater, a big theater in down in South Carolina, and uh, we were able to rehearse a few songs. And that's always fun, you know, yeah. on the mics. It's like kind of like you're going through the motions of like how we would do it on stage. And it feels good that way, as opposed to like a which feels good in a living room or a garage or whatever too, but yeah. it's always nice to be like, you know, pounding it on a mic too. So, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing this, the singer songwriter gets songs are composed originally demos are done on a guitar. Maybe are, th are the oh. other tunes done on mandolin first or how do you, how do you envision them? Sometimes I play guitar. Uh, you mean like in the writing process? Yeah. Or yeah. The writing process, the, the, the bones. Well, uh, sometimes it's mandolin. Sometimes it's guitar. Sometimes I'll like be playing fiddle or something and like, Oh, that's a cool little line. I'm, then I'll like hum it or something. Oh, that's neat. And then uh, yeah. transfer it over to another instrument. It, it, I don't think, I think I write more on the guitar, I think than the mandolin, but the mandolin, I also use it as a, as an instrument for that too. Cause I'll, I want to have like a, the signature lick, you know, like, um, okay. So Megan sent me that Modesto song we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. It has that ba -da 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 -da. it's the signature lick. And I was like, oh, that's gonna sound good on a mandolin, you know. So play on the mandolin and try to figure out the right key for my voice. And, you know, of course, try to play it on the guitar too while I'm practicing it at home. And but when I'm rehearsing for a show, what's interesting is like I, I wanna I wanna play the mandolin because that's typically what I'm playing mm -hmm. on stage, unless I'm playing guitar, but and run the whole song and arrangement from top to bottom. And if I can make it through on the mandolin with singing and all that, I think I'm going to be okay. <laughs> really. I'm the only person I have to worry about in my band. Uh, everybody else is such a beast, you know? <laughs> uh, but to get back to your, you know, the, the mandolin or guitar, I think it, I write more and get the bones of a song more on a guitar and then take the mandolin and try to play it and maybe come up like with some like these signature licks and so on and so forth, or, or a, a little section for a solo or, or a little, you know, a range little section for myself and our banjo player to play something like that. Yeah. And do you, is there a lot of like Dropbox and file trading going on between you and all the band members, or do they get surprised the first day you're all in the same room together with all these songs? I typically send them like some, uh, like, a, the bones of a song like it's just me and a guitar or me and a mandolin playing something uh i'll send them like a roughed out chart or something 
and be like, okay, this is kind of my idea right now, but I'm sure once we're together, everybody's going to have their own like input and rehearsing with the band is so fun because they all have wonderful ideas and come from such a vast array of influences. And I feel like I do too. I grew up going to concerts, listening to Rage Harles or Tower of Power or whatever, you know, um, hearing Merle Haggard, you know, mm-hmm. Point Exton, any, any of these people, you know, that uh, just kind of like they stick with you. If you, if you uh, listen, Newgrass Revival, sure. obviously listen to a lot of Newgrass Revival. Anyway, taking all of those influences and coming together at a rehearsal is is really fun. Sometimes it gets a little like, I think we've painted ourselves into a corner, guys. This arrangement is going to be hard to remember on stage. Can we just like scale it back a little? Or one of my favorite things to say in a rehearsal is uh, uh, you got to hear it to hate it. You know, let's let's try this and try to get this right first and then we'll see if we can scale it back or do something different. You know, so let's hear it so we can hate it first. <laughs> Words to live by. Yeah, right. We talked. We talked about your Lewis mandolin. What What is your primary guitar? Uh, well, I had a a wonderful D eighteen Golden Era for a while. I sold that at one point and um, talked to my friend Tim Finch, uh, who is the basically the one of the dealers for Eastman Guitars. Yeah. And uh, Trey Hensley and I were at uh, the Eastman booth up at this festival called Fresh Grass. Um, up in Massachusetts and we were jamming playing guitars and trading licks and so on and so forth really fun uh, Trey's such a beast and uh, I'm always like man I want to be like Trey when I grow up God, what, a, what an awesome player you know anyway uh, so we we're just having fun on these guitars they were like shade top beautiful um, beautiful sounding instruments and uh, Tim was like well yeah we can figure something out. So anyway, I got one and luckily they were able to hand pick one out. That was kind of a, a more of an exceptional sounding one. Uh-huh. Um, I ended up having to um, take the bridge off. I do some instrument repair and such too. Uh, it was starting to come up. Um, the glue line didn't all go all the way to the edge of the the bridge. So I, you know, I fixed it, did a pro job on that pro job <laughs> and uh glued it back down and uh you know removed it glued, glued it back down cleaned it all up and it was like this such a beast of a guitar it sounds awesome it's you know it's like a copy of a d18 and uh shade top beautiful wood it has like figured uh mahogany and just awesome instrument wow you do repair too i mean didn't dairy kitchen you used to cook as well like isn't that the name? Yeah, yeah. You're exactly. just a renaissance man. Uh, hardly. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I just like to do things. Uh, it, I totally, my personality, just dive all the way in, you know, just yeah. completely. Okay, uh, so let's start with food. Let's go there, and then we'll talk about instrument repair, and then we'll circle back to your mandolin. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, well, food, uh, so my mom was an amazing cook, and she owned a couple of places growing up, just some small little uh, places. She worked as a line cook. She worked as a hostess in restaurants. She had like a health food business, so on and so forth. Uh, so on and so forth. She passed along her love of cooking to me. I would, she would like literally sit me on the counter when I was a baby and toddler and, you know, have me stir things as I grew up and eventually started cooking family meals, you know? And so even in high school, I remember kids coming over, after school saying, uh, what are we having? You know, what's up chef Boyar Frank, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that just led into my whole thing. I've always loved cooking, fishing, hunting, and, uh, cooking, whatever I, I, you know, a catcher or, or, you know, harvest or whatever. And coming from California, a lot of Mexican, uh, culinary influence. My dad is part Filipino. So we get that Filipino Asian influence spent some time in Hawaii. So I get some of that. My mom was part Italian. So I get some of that, you know, I got a lot of like food influences and all those cultures are love food. Right. So in our family growing up, it was all about coming together around a big meal and having a big meal with, with a big, large group of people. And the next thing, you know, instruments start coming out and people start playing music. It was just the norm. So leading that vibe i wanted people to kind of experience that so i started doing this thing where i would cook a meal for like 50 people and do an intimate concert for them 
in their homes. And it, it, it was really fun and inspiring, but some of it became a lot of work. And, um, but that also led into the branding of what I do and, you know, how my love of food, hence the name of the band, Dirty Kitchen. Mm -hmm. And actually it's a name of a tune that is the very first tune I recorded on my very first solo project called Dirty Kitchen. So, And do you ever envision bringing that food music, you know, evening with Frank back? Yeah, I have. It's, and I want to figure out how to do it where it's, uh, mutually fun. Beneficial, <laughs> fun, right? Uh, for me, because it's like a few days of work, really. I can only imagine. Uh, getting things prepped and prepared and cooked and, uh, you know, just like having a three course meal for 50 people is tough to do to serve it all at once. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, I can't imagine you doing, I mean, did you do this by yourself? Did you have help? Uh, I had some friends I would pay to help and the band would help, you know, kind of like, you know, either serve up some food or maybe even like take some dishes or whatever. And, and, you know, it, it was, like I say, it was just, it's a different thing. And mm -hmm. not everybody that signs up to play music signs up to go, you know, do one of those things either. Yeah. Well, I have to, I had to be careful on, you know, what, how to make sure everybody felt okay doing it in my band and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> but it, for me, it just myself, it is a lot more work just for totally. one night that didn't pay as much as playing a festival or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had to figure that out and I would love to do that. And I would love people to experience or at least have a little bit of that kind of vibe of what in my brain and in my heart that I experienced growing up, you know, cause it was so beautiful and unique that uh, I went to a party when I was in high school going like this loud music, people kissing in the corner, what drinking and getting drunk and where are all the instruments, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was like, oh, this isn't my scene. I, I want to go and, you know, have like what music does. It forms a community, you know, uh, like a family. It's like a vehicle for family vibes, really. Totally. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, did you ever work in restaurants professionally or are you just self-taught from your family and, and just doing kind of for friends and loved ones? Well, I, I have consumed a lot of uh, great cookbooks. Uh, yeah. In fact, started writing one a number of years ago. I have yet to finish it, but not that I have anything else to do, right? No, uh, nothing else going on in your life. Yeah. <laughs> but I did work in a couple of restaurants uh, and for a catering service for a little while, uh, for the better part of a year, a couple of years here and there. And honestly, it's just, it's, it wasn't what I wanted, you know, sure. it's, uh, I want what we're talking about, this whole, you know, yeah. family vibe thing. So. It's yeah. a lot of in the kitchen, you know? I, I totally get it. And then you mentioned just kind of that you work on instruments at least once in a while, at least on your guitar. Is that self-taught as well? Uh, well, I've been lucky. I have Michael Lewis as a mentor, uh, a good friend of mine named Roger Simonoff as well. And uh, in fact, I uh, Roger Simonoff took me under his wing to build a mandolin. So I build a mandolin that I play often as well. I've recorded with it. It's a great mandolin. Um, when did you do that? Finished it in 2012, I think. Okay. So yeah, 10 years ago now. But I, the last 10 years I've been off and on with that or my Lewis mandolins. It's a, the one I made is an incredible mandolin. It's a little rough here and there, but uh, you know, I'm, I would assume if I built another one or two or three or whatever, it would be better because I have a lot more experience now, uh, even just repairing instruments. And I've, I've done a lot of setup work over the years too. Okay. So I refret and um, do my all my own kind of repairs on instruments for the most part, unless it's like something super major and I need some help. I'll ask some friends. But that's incredible. Do you have you must have a whole workbench at your house and and got the whole I setup? Have, I have a few workbenches. I have a workbench for mandolins and I have a workbench for uh, leather work and I have a workbench that I've been using for. Um, making picks and things. Yeah. Yeah. So as if you didn't have enough going on, we didn't even talk about that. You started a pick company. I did. Yeah. Tone slabs. So better part of a year and a half, I've been working with my partner, David Welch, and he lives down in Florida and all started just like, you know, sending messages back and forth on Instagram about, Oh, look at this. How do you do that? And, you know, I would share any information I had about making picks with him. And it was, uh, so we started this venture of trying to figure out the best material that would like mimic 
or exceed the tonal qualities and uh, playability of the benchmark, which is what everybody wants or kind of leans towards as far as sound goes is tortoise shell. And so we found a material uh, after, like I say, about a year and a half or about a year actually um, that does just that. And it's, it's a very, we polish it. And, it, and in fact, it, it doesn't see, it doesn't slip out of your fingers either, even though it's really smooth. It's like the more kind of uh, like sweat you have in your fingers or whatever, the more moisture it seems to like grip a little bit more. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Which and, is what people, this is one of the reasons, many reasons people still are trying to seek out old tortoise shell picks is because the, the grip, right? Is if I'm, Partly. Yeah. And yeah. the tone actually, yeah. uh, the tone is, is the thing that, um, and that's in the name of our company, Tone Slabs. You know, we uh, I, we think we have got got the thing. And uh, the first question everybody asks is, "What is it made out of?" And I like to tell them, "Well, it's unobtainium mixed with eleven uh, secret herbs and spices." Yes. So, I mean, is there? Can you tell us? Is there a melting going on? Is there a mold of some sort? Oh uh, no! Um, okay. So we get it from a company that um, honestly they. Uh, one of the things they specialize in is bulletproof glass. Okay. So they came up with a formula for us that is, uh, you know, with the dyes that they use and the hardeners and so on and so forth, that it, it's just somehow came to be this awesome material. Okay. Just kind of stumbled on it, honestly. Yeah. So if you had like a gypsy jazz pick from you, it might be bulletproof. Is that what we're getting at? <laughs> Maybe yeah, you can put it on your chest right here. Really good shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know about that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't endorse that at all. But, when, uh, when we get into these like higher end picks, I mean, I think bluegrass players and gypsy jazz players totally have bought into it, but there are still a lot of people going like, I can go buy a fender pick for, you know, 25 cents or whatever they go for these days. I don't know with right. inflation, how much hand tooling, how much for each, you know, 30, 40, $50 pick that is sold. Like, is there a lot of finesse and stuff going on behind the scenes? It's not just a stamp, right? No. So we have invested in some CNC machinery. And so we CNC all of these picks out of a, uh, we get them in sheets now. Um, And then we thickness it and everything. But from that point, once we get the right thickness uh, is all hand beveled with uh, different tools and uh, sandpapers and eventually on like four sets of polishing wheels and it comes, yeah. So each pick is handled by one person for a while, you know, and it is, it is the bevel in my opinion is like the, the key ingredient for tone. And there's a lot of picks where the bevel is just like a, just a straight flat, you know, from one side of the pick to the other, yep. like a right hand bevel. Uh, ours are, uh, I could show you with my hands, but to try to explain it over the podcast, it's like you take a, it's a rounded kind contour of, contour of sorts. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a rounded contour all the way to the other edge of the pick. And it's it, what that does. It doesn't force you into an angle. Uh, so you get a lot of picks. It just has one angle of the, of the bevel and you're forced into that angle or you're forced into um kind of like creating your own bevel by the wear on the pick, if that makes sense. The rounded bevel gives you uh, a fatter, more round tone, and it makes for easier wear. You're able to wear in your own bevel with your own hand motion a lot easier. It just becomes more natural of a pick and sounds, it, it doesn't, you don't hear the, cl- the, the pick noise either you start having this really clean sound and you only hear really the instrument at that point. So, and that's, that's the, for me, that's the epitome of the tone I want to get, which is the instrument. I don't want to hear any, you know, the pick chirp of certain types of material. I don't want to hear the, uh, the, the slap of the pick. It's the string. I want it. I want it to be smooth as glass going right over the string. So I can only hear the instrument. And we're talking uh, in terms of thickness. Uh, we we had this conversation a little earlier, but it starts at one point two, and then how thick do you go? 
1.5, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and 1.5. And we can do custom stuff too. Uh, if you order online, there's like a $5 upcharge to order something more custom if you want. Yeah. Whether it be a bevel or a color or a, you know, a shape or whatever, we can do all that. You've got a cool uh, color array as well. Yeah. It's, it's kind of almost a little pastel, but, yeah. um, but you're, yeah, it's not like some dingy color. That's for sure. It's bright and it's, it's fun. And, you know, it, it produces an incredible tone. We, my partner and I, we've been going through like, uh, you know, tone slabs and we want to have like a, uh, you know, because your, your girlfriend's husband has one or, you know, tone slabs, you might suck, but your tone shouldn't have to, you know? Sure. Yeah. Well, and it's a scientific fact that uh, if you spend $45 on a pick, you're like 10 times less likely to lose it because you'll, you're paranoid all the time. <laughs> you, you have a little special spot on your dresser or whatever where you keep it. Well, pretty much. Either here, Here's what I do. And I've been using expensive picks for forever, making my own picks too out of different materials uh, through the years. And it's either in my strings. The pick I'm using is either in my strings or in my fingers. And so, hey, can I play your instrument? Sure. Can I borrow your pick? Where's yours? You know, like, no, <laughs> this is mine. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have your own pick, you can't use, you can't play my own instrument, you know, for the most part, unless it's like somebody I really trust or whatever. But there's a, uh, we also sell these pick tins that are lined with like felt. So you can keep them in your case where you won't lose them, you know, either in the pick tin or in your fingers. That would probably be a good way to do it, you know? Totally. So, so we're trying to think of those things. Uh, we have like a little, uh, we're, we're developing a little buffing kit, you know, in case you want to just like, like I do this with every pick I have, I have like a little, um, it's like a nail buffer, but it has like a, uh, kind of like a rough, a fine, an extra fine. And then like a super polished side, like four sides to it. And I'll just, you know, take as I would across the strings, just the same motion on, on the polishing, like one, two, three, and then the next corner, one, two, three, next corner, one, two, three, turn the pick over one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Wow. And then I'm like, okay, ready for the show. So wow. it's super quick. And I'm thinking, well, that would be fun for Bill to have a little more pick longevity, maybe. So uh -huh. just try to like, if they're going to invest that in a pick, they should have all of the things that they're going to have need to like, keep it for a while. So, and, and you get to feel like a chef, you know, at a fancy restaurant <laughs> sharpening their knives. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I love sharpening knives, man. It's one of my favorite things. I figured you did. I'm sure yeah. I have a feeling you've probably made your own knife at one point. Actually, I make <laughs> knives as well. Yes. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I've uh, sold plenty of knives uh, and I make the leather um, sheaths to go around them, hand tool leather. And I, actually, I make leather straps for guitars and, and mandolins. Trey Hensley, speaking of which, we talked about him earlier. He has a couple of my guitar straps. Billy Strings has a guitar strap and a belt I made for him. And uh, a bunch of people have... Uh, you know, these hand tooled leather straps that I make. How, how blingy do you go with these straps? Are they like total nudie suit ready? You know, no, <laughs> they're, they're hand tooled leather and, and dyed. You can check them out online. I have some great pictures that uh, it's called the soul works T H E S O L. Like my last name, soul Within, the soul works.com. You're a man yeah. of many talents. How do you balance all this stuff? I mean, I imagine the picks are mostly done by your partner. And you can't be man in a CNC. I don't think maybe you are. Uh, I don't have one here at the house, but he sends me blanks and I, and I do work on some of the picks. <laughs> okay. he's been, actually he's been busting out. We just had a bunch of orders from like, um, God, Banjo Ben and acoustic shop. We're working, uh, elderly instruments. We're working on a, uh, a package for Carter vintage. So we're okay. we got, got a bunch of picks heading out and he's been a beast in, in there. And I've been kind of on the road touring this record. And he's like, man, if, I can do this, you know, until, you know, we, we, we need to like have you working on some of these picks, which I, I, you know, admittedly make some badass picks because I've been doing it for so long. And, uh, you know, I will eventually be making a lot of the picks too, I think. And I'm, I'm excited about tone slabs, man. People are digging them. The only feedback we've gotten has been great. And, and of course there's going to be something here and there. I think we've, uh, we've had to like replace a couple of picks, uh, Somebody had one that, that, uh, you know, out of the hundreds and hundreds that we've made already, uh, in 
we launched the site at the beginning of July. So July, oh, wow. August, September, and here Cranking we are. Them out. Yeah. So I think we've only replaced like one or two picks that uh, the material maybe had. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it was player induced or, or it was the material. I don't know, but we've replaced a, like, I think two picks. Okay. And that's what we want to stand by. Like we we were like all about it. Like we stand by this material. We stand by the the tone. Like if you got a problem, yeah. just let us know, you know, we're going to, we're going to make it right and fix it. So Wild. So you've got, uh, you've got all these little side hustles. You got music. How do you, how do you figure it out though? Like it is obviously music is first and foremost. And then Rest out, man. No. <laughs> uh, you, you, you've got a social life. You've got a significant other, like uh, is obviously music is first and foremost. And then if you've got downtime, it's like, I'm going to do a batch of um, straps or I'm going to put a little more energy into the picks or how does it all go down? Yeah, I have a, like a half a dozen custom picks I'm making for somebody here pretty soon. And then I have a couple of straps I have to make. I just sent out a strap last week for a banjo player. He just posted it on Instagram just yesterday, actually. He had a banjo strap. But to really answer your question, the balance, I mean, sometimes it's, it's hard for sure. Uh, but, you know, I, I could work 24-7, honestly. But I have to like figure out, okay, I'm, I'm working this amount of time. I can't get it all done within this amount of time, but I can get some of it done. I just have to be okay with that and then move on to the next time or whatever. It's, sometimes it can be a little overwhelming, but um, I'm glad to have a partner in Tone Slabs. I'm glad to have uh, a band that, you know, plays their butts off and yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad to have, you know, a booking agent helping with that and, a, you know, record label, all of the things that kind of like, uh, help, you know, and a partner, Jillian, she helps with, uh, with, uh, a lot of the bookkeeping and, um, some of the management stuff for me too. So we're all in it together, you know? I love um, it. Now we're, we're talking in mid October here. What's the rest of your year, year look like? Are you doing more, a lot of more touring? Uh, we have basically four more gigs with the band Two, uh, we're playing, uh, October 28th at, in Philly at the City Winery, a festival in Maryland called the Sultana Downrigging Festival and Bluegrass Festival. Um, and then uh, we're up to New York State, up kind of near Rochester, playing the Fort Hill Performing Arts Center, and then uh, New York at Cafe Wa. We're closing it all up on the on November 6th. And then it's kind of, I got some littler shows, duo shows with Jillian. She plays too. And then... Um, kind of working on picks and leather for the holidays, honestly, through November and into December. Okay. And then uh, it's, uh, you know, kind of looking at next year, got a few things kind of lining up for January and February, but mostly it's kind of like after February, we can kind of hit it again. So we have a little bit of downtime. Yeah. So it'll be interesting when we all get back together and uh, forget all the tunes that we were in arrangements we were just playing and have to even bring some more <laughs> tunes into the mix it's always a fun time you know <laughs> you'll probably have a new side business too by then yeah maybe <laughs> <laughs> not to mention i love to cook right you were talking about that uh traeger grills are you familiar with traeger of grills? course yeah so I've, i'm kind of a quote-unquote influencer for them or whatever so uh i post on instagram and and facebook sometimes the smoked things that i i make so if anybody's interested in that stuff they should try to follow me on there and, and check that stuff out man of many talents frank thank you so much oh thank you so much god thanks for the opportunity to blab about the things i do man appreciate it so much 